church. <sighs> Here we are again, I'm afraid, uh, sitting behind my desk in my study, uh, speaking to you whenever we, we could maybe be uh, in front of each other. But the, tr the reality is, the situation being as it is, um, the church we've decided to just close for a few weeks just to put people's mind at ease, to be safe. And so I trust that as you're watching this, you are safe, you are well. And I pray that God will, will bless this time together. Christ is still king. He is unchanged. It was true going into 2020. It is still true coming out of it and going into 2021. And in the darkness and in the distress, perhaps all of these days, the onus is on us as believers all the more to be light and to be salt in these times. And so we've got a new sort of mini series, uh, two or three studies just uh, for the next step. I've called it Unstuck, getting out of maybe some of the routines and some of the bad habits that we've picked up over the last year with everything being the way it has been. And looking for, okay, well, what is the next step? How do we move forward? Rather than just sort of treading water, how do we move forward? So that is our series, and we'll be looking at that starting in Ephesians 5 this morning. Going ahead, um, we will have our prayer meeting on Zoom on Wednesday evening. And so if you are part of Zoom, if you're on that, we'll send out the details uh, on Facebook and the prayer chain. Um, I know it's not the same as a regular prayer meeting, but I also believe that the, the more who are there, who are talking to each other and praying with each other, the better the experience will be. And so I encourage you, please, Wednesday evening, come along and be with us in prayer for the church and for our country moving forward this year. There is no fit defence this week, um, so you have another sort of week or so before we're going to make you move about too much, and Alan and the team will be back on Monday the 11th of January. So uh, they're taking a bit of a break, and they've been going from the summer right through, and so we're very thankful for them, but uh, they're taking a well-deserved break um, as, uh, as maybe they try to work off some of the turkey as well. Um, the other thing just before we... Uh, have our first song is uh, the offering that we've had over the over the Christmas period. Um, we were collecting for John and Jennifer uh, Young, and the church said, "Look, whatever we raise for that, we will match it and we will donate to the local food bank." And so uh, we had a really good offering, uh, considering numbers were down, people were sheltering, people were bubbling, people had responsibilities with family and friends, and so. Both groups are going to get £350 and they've already received it. So thank you so much for that uh, generous giving um, over, over a tough time. So thank you. It really does mean a lot. Let's pray and then we will um, worship and then we'll have a kids talk. So let's, let's do that. Father, thank you. Thank you for the freshness that a new year brings for the sense of opportunity and the, the turning of a page. But Lord, the truth is that uh, many of the burdens and issues and problems uh, will follow us in, into this new year. And so Lord, I pray that you will bring peace, you will bring light, you will bring comfort, you will bring healing, you will bring peace into this new year, Lord, that you will meet the needs of your people. Lord, as we seek you, as we turn to you, Lord, that we would uh, find you all that we could ever want you to be and more that you are a god who exceedingly and abundantly does more that we could even imagine lord that you are a god who blesses you're a god who heals lord that you are a god even of the impossible and so lord while politicians will fail us and let us down whenever friends and neighbors are inconsistent even despite the best intentions Lord, we come to the one who can never disappoint, the one who is consistent, the one who is unchanging. And ask, Lord, that you would bless us. Bless our church. Lord, bless the, the people who, who make up our church. Lord, keep them safe. But Lord, also may we flourish in the year that lies ahead. And we ask this in your precious name. Amen. All right, folks. And so well, here's, a, here's a new song for you. 
I love it and uh, may it bless you. Because something that, uh, well, a question that my 
mom and dad asked me a lot growing up was, are you wise? And that got me thinking about the wise men. And I was just wondering, I wonder if the boys and girls of our church are wise or silly. So I thought I'd maybe ask a couple of questions in a quickly quiz called, are you wise? So let me ask you this very quickly. Uh, what's five plus two? Get it? Okay. Uh, is a tomato a fruit or vegetable? No cheating? No, uh, no cheating? Okay. Uh, what's the capital city of Spain? Hmm. Okay. Hmm. So let me ask you, are you wise? Are you wise? Hmm. You see, when it comes to the wise men, that's a question that I've always wondered. You see, the Bible says that there are they're really called magi. So I've always wondered, I wonder how wise these wise men were. I'd love to ask them, are you wise? You see, when Jesus was about a year old, maybe 18 months old, he's starting to walk, maybe starting to talk, he had a special group of visitors. These magi show up. Not, not when he a baby in the manger with the shepherds. No, no. They, they, they come a lot later and they bring the gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh and they start to make their journey home. I was thinking about this but when I was doing uh, the devotionals with Sophie and Bethany. I wonder what happened to them after that night. We know when the angel shows up and says, look, don't go back to Herod. He's a bad guy, bad dude. He's got bad plans. Don't go back and tell him about the baby. So they go, Roger, no problem and they go home but what happened when they went home did they think much more about it how different were their lives after that adventure did they become christian magi in babylon like daniel when he came out of the lion's den he was a magi like they were did they just move on to the next project follow the next star did they keep tabs on the baby growing up did they wait long enough to see what he was like whenever he started preaching whenever he was 30? Or had they given up by then going, ah, that baby's not magic after all? They didn't wait. See, I think it boils down to this. I think you're wise if you still seek after Jesus. Christmas is only over if we put away all the decorations and find a place for all our toys and then just forget about how truly amazing that first Christmas really was. How amazing that message really is that God came to us because he loves us so much and because he loves us, he died to take away our sins. If we forget about that, if we just put it away for another while, forget about it until next Sunday, I don't think that's very wise. See, Christmas is really only over when we stop getting excited about Jesus. It's over when we lose interest in him. So let's keep the magic and wonder of Christmas alive all this year by being wise enough to keep looking to Jesus, keep looking to who he was and what he's done for us. So let me ask you this question. Are you wise? I really hope the wise men stay focused on Jesus. I, I hope they didn't just move on and forget about him or just go on to the next thing. I, I hope you'll be like the wise men. The Bible says in Psalm 103 verse 2, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget none of his benefits. Let's not forget about Jesus. Let's not forget uh, about him until Easter. Let's not forget about him until we go to church again. Let's not forget about him until the next time we, we have a, a children's talk in church. Let's always remember. Let's be wise. And remember to celebrate Jesus every day. That God loves us so much. Let's do it every day. Let, let's remember at, at every mealtime that God has provided for. Let's be wise this year. Stay safe, guys, and I'll see you soon. I really miss you. So see you soon, okay? We're going to have another song now, uh, a new song, uh, and I love it. It's beautiful. It's brilliant. The words are amazing. So please listen to the words, listen to the song, and then we'll get around God's word. God bless.
spend a few weeks talking about being ready for 2021 in a new mini-series called Unstuck. Uh, the idea is by getting out of our ruts and maybe some of the bad habits that we've got into uh, with lockdown and over 2020 with maybe being away from church and being away from our activities and all our organisations and kind of getting out of those spiritual ruts and bad habits and moving forward and growing in the Lord, uh, regardless of the circumstances around us. I remember this time last year, standing on the stage in our church and talking about having 2020 vision. Well, <laughs> I don't think anyone saw 2020 coming, uh, panning out the way it did. So I guess the old adage really is true that only hindsight is 2020. But this time of year, we are bombarded with various reviews of the year, highlights, lowlights, the standout moments of the year. I think back to the weddings that we've had in our church, the Warks, the Hamiltons, the Flemings. I think of the churches coming together and coordinating a town-wide response to the COVID-19 crisis where we did groceries and hospital runs. And OK, yes, our own church helpline didn't gather that much traction. The central town-wide one did, and so we were able to be involved in that, and we are even able to be part of giving out 500 free Christmas meals, thanks to a very generous donor last week. We've seen the goodness of God at work, even in the midst of the trials. 
Of course, wider highlights might include an amazing man, so Captain Tom Moore, uh, walking 100 laps of his garden before his 100th birthday, inspiring £30 million worth of donations to NHS charities. We've heard people clapping. We saw windows lit up in rainbows for our amazing frontline workers. And what maybe looks like a vaccine, with the turnaround time of which is incredible, and we pray it's effective and we can allow it can allow us to, to have some sort of normality soon. We saw the good side of people. We saw the bad side as well, of course. But when we look back this year with hindsight, I'm sure history will prove that it taught us a lot. It taught us a lot about our society, our politicians, our teachers and many in frontline workers that they're desperately undervalued and underpaid. And as someone who's getting ready to homeschool again next week, yeah, we need to, those teachers are worth their weight in gold. Pay them whatever they want. And usually at this time of year as well, we have some so-called experts trying to tell us what they expect in the year that lies ahead. Now, for the most, it's harmless fun. Fashion trends, hairstyle trends, sports predictions. Sometimes they get it right, sometimes they get it wrong, some more famously than others. Back in 1987, the Apple Corporation predicted the iPhone. They had a prototype and all, a, a mobile device with a front-facing camera and Siri. Yeah. Now, okay, it was the size of a lever arch file, but you can see it. There's a video of them displaying it. It's impressive to see 20 years ahead to the first iPhone in 2007. Siri didn't arrive to 2011. Think, they were able to predict voice command internet searches before the internet was even a thing. We'll go back even further to 1900, when articles appeared by John Elfrith, who predicted digital photography by the year 2000. Remember, back then you were only hiding under a black sheet and your plates hanging up. But he predicted being able to take an image of goings on in a war zone in the other end of the world uh, and to send those pictures so they could be in the newspapers the next morning. He also predicted Americans would be two inches taller. Wireless telephones would span the world. That's impressive foresight. Not so impressive though was the widely predicted expectation by so-called prophets back in 1967. They decided that technology would so dominate our lives that by the year 2000 we would only work 22 hours a week. We wish. But they also were saying that we would only work 27 weeks of the year. So that equates to three days a week, every other week. Our biggest concern as a society would be how to fill all our free time. That's just not true. Technology has meant the opposite, that we never stop working because we think we can and should do more. And it's become addictive to us. And it's killing us. We can't disconnect. We're even texting while driving. I'm not saying I do it. I'm just saying it's done. We know it's dangerous. We know that there's people who have died and there's been accidents because of it, but we can't help ourselves. So as we stand at the doorway of 2021, what does the year ahead look like? The truth is, we really don't know. I thought I'd be speaking to you in person right now on the platform in our church up until Wednesday evening. I thought I would be doing that. I never thought in March we'd still be in this position. We do not know what tomorrow holds, but we know who holds the future. And that's the great hope of the Christian, isn't it? And that's what we need to do going forward into 2021. I don't know about this, but I know him and he knows all about this stuff that's going on around us. And that's the point that Paul is trying to make when he's writing to the Ephesian church. He had spent three years leading the church and now he's writing to them from a Roman prison and he's wanting to encourage them and remind them about what they should know and what they should be doing in the days that lie ahead. And that's really the split in the book. The first three chapters are all about who they are in Christ, the wealth of a believer. And then chapters four, five and six are about how they ought to live for Christ, the walk of a believer really common metaphor with Paul. He often describes the Christian life as a walk. Sometimes he calls it a run. Sometimes, if we're being honest, it feels like a crawl. But so often he comes back to this idea of a walk, a steady, consistent, maintainable pace, the lifestyle of a believer walking towards heaven. 
And so the context of what we're going to be looking at, and it's important to look at context. Chapter 4, he's talking about walking in humility, walking in unity, walking in uniqueness and being different from the world. He talks about walking in love and walking in light. And by the time we come to chapter 5, where we want to look at this morning, he's talking about walking in wisdom. So let's read chapter 5, verses 15 to 17. He says, Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time, because the days are evil. Therefore do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Three verses, and it yields three principles for the coming year, not just this year, but for every year that we have left to live. There's a harbour in Italy and it can only be reached by sailing up a narrow channel between dangerous rocks and the shoals. Over the years, many ships have been wrecked, people trying to, to navigate this. It's tough, it's hard, it's difficult. And so to guide the ships in, they, they put three large lights onto huge poles mounted in the harbour. And when you're sailing in, if you can get the three lights to align as one, then that you're on course and you'll make it through, no problem, through the channel. I think if we can take the three principles here from these verses and line them up, it'll guide us safely through 2021. The first thing that we have to do is walk carefully. In this new year, walk carefully. That's what this verse says. If you have an older Bible, it might say walk circumspectly. It means to look around as you walk. Paul is telling the church in Ephesus, look, watch and look around as you take each step. It's, it's a call to exact living, living with precision. The Christian life is not to be lived haphazardly that with the kind of, well, yeah, whatever kind of an attitude, sure, it will do. I think that attitude is really killing our church and our country. We're so lax with how we walk. Oh, we're, we're very particular about the production values of a worship service. The music has to be right. The lighting has to be right. All, all, all those things have to be good. But when it comes to how we live in front of unsaved friends and family and co-workers, we lack that precision. We're not careful enough. It's like we haven't like grown that eight-year-old inside of us who thinks that the naughty kid is cool. And so we want to look cool too. And so it's like, yeah, I don't care what my dad says either. And we've gotten lax trying to look cool in front of the world. It's this playground immaturity. We want to look cool instead. Uh, but the Christian life is supposed to be precise. Lives by the governing principles of the Bible with the desire for exactness. We want to get it right. We want to do the best that we can. We want to give our all to living for God. I know a guy, a good friend, uh, who works for as a youth worker in a big church in Belfast. Um, I was his youth pastor uh, years ago, but when I, I was his youth pastor, he worked in one of those really snobby coffee shops in Belfast. And I mean, you know, the really snobby ones. Going to his house for a coffee is an experience. Um, now, whenever I make coffee, I'll just throw some instant granules, boil some water, fire some milk in, maybe some sugar, neck it, move on. Okay, I'm not very precise when it comes to my coffee. For him, he'll grind his own beans. He'll measure the temperature of the water to add, to, to, to add everything at the right, just the exact moment. The thought of adding milk is blasphemy to him. I mean, he would genuinely be really cross if you went to his house and started throwing milk and sugar into his coffee that he made. One of us is precise in our coffee making steps, the other isn't. In one sense, who really cares? It's only coffee, it doesn't make that much of a difference, says the guy who isn't very precise. But coffee isn't a big issue, but imagine if your heart surgeon had that attitude. Because, well, then you really want someone who's gonna pay attention to precision and accuracy and attention to detail. That's very much a desirable quality. And this is Paul's point to Ephesus. How we walk is serious. It is important. There are consequences to getting it right and getting it wrong. It should be a matter of importance. And we're told that the gate is narrow where we enter, but it also says that the way is narrow for the believer. We walk in a narrow path, so we need to be precise in our steps. We've been told that the enemy is out there wanting to attack and destroy our witness and our testimony. So we have to walk with precision. We have to walk circumspectly, carefully. 
Let's go into the new year. Make sure you're watching carefully how you walk and how you make your decisions. That's the first pole in our harbour. But it's explained to us in the rest of the verse. Look carefully how then you walk, not as unwise, but as wise. Walking carefully means walking with wisdom. And the Bible contrasts the ways of wisdom against the ways of foolishness. It's not really a discussion about education. The Bible isn't interested in how academic you think you are, or how many books you've read. This isn't a conversation about intelligence. In the Bible, wisdom is about how you apply the information that you do have. What do you do with the knowledge that you have gathered, whether it's a lot or whether it's a little? What do you do with what you've been given? So you may be intelligent enough to know that a tomato is a fruit and not a vegetable, but you may not be wise enough to leave it out of your fruit salad. It's that distinction. How do you use the information that you have? You see, you can be smart and foolish according to the Bible. I came across an article about measuring knowledge, that mankind is growing exponentially in knowledge and it's astonishing. Uh, the takeaway point for the article for us this morning is that if you could quantify all of human knowledge from the beginning of recorded history right up to 1845, it's about an inch. But in the hundred years from 1845 to 1945, it's three inches. From the 30 years from 1945 to 75, it's 550 feet. Okay, four scrabble towers piled up on top of each other, if that gives you a visual idea of what 550 feet is. And what we've learned since then is four times that again. The rate is increasing exponentially. But you can have lots of information and still lack wisdom. The Bible isn't talking about the volume of information that you have, and we've got all of it at our fingertips on our phones and our iPads and Google but when the Bible talks about wisdom, it wants to know what you're going to do with that information. Second Timothy 3 talks of those who are always learning, but never able to arrive at a knowledge of the truth. See, when the Bible talks about wisdom and foolishness, it's not about your IQ. In fact, the Bible's definition of a fool is not someone who is uneducated, but someone who in their heart has said that there is no God. Psalm 14. A fool is someone who denies God, but it's not talking about an atheist. There weren't an awful lot of atheists when David was writing this. Literally, it's someone who says in their heart, no God. It's not denying the existence of God. It's saying no to the lordship of God in our lives. So imagine you're sitting on your sofa right now. You're sitting in bed and you're watching a service and someone says, do you want more sweets? Now, bear with me here, okay? Really try to imagine. Try at least. Imagine saying no sweets. No sweets. Now, I don't think any of us have said no to sweets in the last 10 days or so, but imagine saying no sweets. You're not saying that you don't believe that there's such a thing as sweets. You're not saying that you don't believe that there are sweets out there somewhere. What you are saying is that I do not want the presence or influence or impact of those sweets in my life. That's what these verses in, in Psalm 14 are saying. A fool will say no to the presence and influence and lordship and influence of God in their life. Only a fool would do that. To reject a good and loving and awesome God. No God. You've got no claim on me. So really what you're saying is you can have a theological Christian but still be a practical atheist. You believe in things. You, you will say, look, I agree with these principles and these outlooks in life. But the way that you live doesn't reflect those values or beliefs. Oh, I believe in prayer. But you don't pray. I believe God will provide. But, you know, I insist on being the provider. I will do it myself. The Bible says, look, that's foolish. That's a foolish way to walk. So be careful how you walk this year. Be specific. Think about how you will live out your life in front of people. Not like a foolish person who will do just whatever, not thinking about consequences. Let there be a conviction to connect what you believe in your heart and head to be lived out in your words and your actions. And I'm not against information. I truly believe that the more believers there are who are well educated and sharing their faith with intelligence is a good thing for the church. In fact, back in Hosea, God said, Look, my people perish because of a lack of knowledge. Peter says, grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Christ Jesus. But my point is that this knowledge that we have has to bear fruit. It has to be applied 
well. So walk carefully. Grow in grace and knowledge of him this year. Let the reality of God shape your purchases, shape your habits, shape your relationships this year. The movies that you watch, be wise, be precise, live on purpose, with purpose. The next pool in our harbour for 2021 is in the next verse. Verse 16 says, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. So the first pool, walk carefully. Second pool, watch faithfully. The idea is that we're faithfully watching for opportunities. We redeem the time. Time's a very interesting thing. Uh, time as a concept is relative, Einstein tells us. We go through our lives guided by time. Our schools, our work, our appointments all rotate around start times, finish times. We have special days of the year marked aside in the calendar for Christmas, for birthdays, for New Year. It's just another day. But we've decided to mark it out in the calendar that this day, January the 1st, will mark a new journey around the sun. Celebrate on this day. Make resolutions on this day. But it's just another day. But we set it aside. Now, when we talk about time like that, the Greek word in the Bible is chronos. So we get words like chronology or the scientific word for a watch, which is a chronometer, measuring time by calendars and days and hours and minutes. But here in Ephesians, the word for time isn't chronos, it's kairos. That means event time, opportunity that comes, a window of time that has to be seized. Carpe diem, seize the day, make the most of your time. That's what the Bible is saying here. You see, as, as we go into the new year, we can see the day ahead of us as Kronos, just another day in the calendar. Let's go through the pattern. Let's go through the routine. Let's do the same things that we're always doing. Or we can see the day as Kairos, an opportunity. Each meal that we have is Kairos to, to make a good decision, an opportunity to have a healthy choice or an unhealthy choice. Do I run today or not? Yes, I will. That's Kairos. I, I, I'm going to make now an opportune time. I'm going to take this time. I'm going to seize it to, to be healthy, to, to exercise, to look after myself. And what that means is that over time, over the years, over the chronology of our life, these little windows of time seized, they all add up to shape and define our lives. This verse is about redeeming our time. It's not about counting how much time you have, but making the time that you have count. Looking at the things as an opportunity. So Paul says, redeem the time, make a count. And maybe over Christmas, you've got a gift card. Well, what do you have to do with that? You have to redeem it. But if you ignore it, there's no value in it. You have to utilize it. You have to seize the opportunity, the window of that voucher, because there's a deadline to it. So you have to use it. And you do so and you get the full value out of it. And Paul here is saying, redeem the kairos. He's saying this life is full of little windows of opportunities to make your spiritual life grow and flourish and to make your walk uh, make a difference, to make it count. Make the most of these windows. Redeem them. And that's why this is the second pool, because we don't get second chances to redo today. We move on to a new day, a new window of time. The old one slams shut, so we can't change 2020 now. That window is closed. So what are we going to do with the windows that lie ahead of us? See, once we run out of time here, we enter eternity. At that point, it's too late to start sharing the gospel. In heaven, nobody needs it. Right? They're already saved and living in the fullness of it. You will run out of windows to share your faith at some point. Eventually, a window will close and it will be the last window you have. No more sermons, no more texts, no more invitations. So while we have time, seize that time for the glory of God. Walk carefully. Watch faithfully. Jesus said in John 9, that I must do the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night's coming where no one can work. Now is the time to seize the moments that we have in front of us. I remember scanning a book about time and it's uh, actually the book's called About Time. Uh, in it, the author Leslie Flynn said that, that when you turn 35, you only have about 500 days of your life left to live. Now, that doesn't seem right to me. OK, if I live to 80, I've got 42 years left. 
15,633 days if I live to my 80th birthday. So this author, his maths is off. How do I only have 500 days? Well, he says, by the time you take away all the time you spend on hygiene and working and sleeping on holidays and childcare and odd jobs, you actually only have 500 days that are completely free. Now that changes the math a lot, doesn't it? I'm maybe down to 480 days. That's a lot less than 15,633. Uh, 15, all of a sudden, I'm, I'm, I'm starting to feel the pinch a wee bit more than that. But there's maybe something fundamentally wrong with this argument. Maybe you've seen it. The fundamental flaw to the thinking is that I may not have any days left. No one is guaranteed 80 days, 80 years. No one is guaranteed tomorrow. Many of you will have felt that quite acutely this Christmas time. But the Bible says our life is a vapour, a breath. <sighs> That's it. So, so. That's why it matters where you put yourself on the scale, whether you have a long time left or a short time left, whatever, it doesn't matter. Now is the time of opportunity. Now is the kairos, the opportunity. The window is open now to seize for the glory of God. Will you seize the windows that you have in front of you today, tomorrow, this year? Will you look back and say, 2021, that was the year I seized the opportunities for God. And verse 16 it qualifies it. Why? Why should I have to do this? Why is there so much pressure to redeem the time? Because the days are evil. December was my wedding anniversary. Uh, and I look at myself in the mirror today uh, and I then looked at the wedding pictures and I think, yeah, the days are evil. The days certainly have not been my friend <laughs> in those 11 years. But you see, we know that the devil's a thief, right? We, we know this. We've realised this by now. He wants to rob from us, to steal, to kill and destroy. But one of the things that Satan wants to steal most from you is your time. Oh, he will love to steal your time. To keep you busy and preoccupied with so many other things, with lesser things. Time is one of our most precious commodities and he will love to steal it. You notice how much time we waste. We've talked about it. I mean, from March in, in the first lockdown, we talked about how we're going to achieve so much and once we maybe painted one room or, or did a little bit, it kind of got away from us then. Turns out the reason why I don't run isn't because I'm really busy with the girls in the morning and doing school runs. I didn't do them for six months. Still didn't run. <laughs> so there must be some other reason. Think about the time that we waste watching TV. Time we waste on toxic friendships. People pleasing. Think how much time is wasted in sin. Saying unkind things, getting into gossip or arguments. Time wasted holding on to grudges. Time spent being too tipsy, too worldly to shine out for the Lord. Being unwise in our walk. The Bible talks about people who waste these windows of opportunity. Days of Noah. He, Noah preached for decades and yet only eight people were in the ark. So many others missed the window of opportunity. The parable of the ten virgins. The five wool, foolish virgins. Uh, not woolly virgins. Uh, five <laughs> foolish virgins uh, who didn't have oil for the wedding feast lamps. They, they missed the window of opportunity. Or how, how Jesus wept over Jerusalem and, and he says, oh, I wish I could gather you up like a mother hen gathers up his chicks. He says in Luke 19, oh, would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace. But now they are hidden from your eyes for the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side and tear you down to the ground. You and your children within you. And they will not leave one stone upon the other in you because you did not know the time of your visitation. Or what about the most famous one, Judas Iscariot. He had three years with the Lord himself. What excuses could he possibly have? But he missed the opportunity to save his own soul. So be careful this year, folks. There will be things that will come along that will try to rob you of your time and to steal away these opportunities that God is providing for us. Good things, things that seem helpful. But one of the greatest words that you can learn to use this year is no. Remember Mary and Martha? 
Mary sat at the Saviour's feet while Martha ran around cooking and sorting everything out and she gets cross. Well, was she doing anything wrong? No, she was being helpful. She was being a good host. That was important in that culture. But she missed out because the Saviour was sitting in their living room. And she's somewhere else. Too busy. Not enough time. Folks, redeem the time. Watch carefully for the opportunities that come and for the enemy who will try his hardest to steal and distract you this year. Let me give you one more poll very quickly. Work thoughtfully. Verse 17, therefore, because of these other two polls, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Easy. Do what God wants you to do in the new year. Easy, all right? That's all we have to do. Just do what he wants us to do. Except we don't always know what he wants us to do, right? Paul here says that you, you can understand it. You can know. So the question is, how? How do we understand what the will of God is for us this year? Well, God's will is revealed in God's word. So if you want to know God's plan and purposes and will for you, you need to get stuck into the word. Get stuck into the book that has given his plans for us. Principles that will guide each and every one of us through this year. It's called God's general revelation. Principles that he wants for all of us. But here's the thing. So many Christians don't want to know about those general revelations. They only want the specifics. But we've got it backwards if we're thinking like that. Trust me when I say this to you. If we start with the general principles and apply them, I guarantee that so many of the specifics will start to take care of themselves. We get hung up on, well, which specific house should I buy? Which specific subjects should I study? Which specific car should I buy? Which specific job should I apply for? But we neglect the general principles that should be guiding us. Let me give you five things that we know God wants from me. Number one, God wants unsaved people to become saved people. Second Peter 3, 9, the Lord is not willing that any should perish, but all come to repentance. God's will for you is that you're saved. 1 Timothy 2, 4, he desires that all people should be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. So God wants saved people, uh, unsaved people to become saved people. Number two, he wants saved people to become holy people, especially in the area of sexual morality. 1 Thessalonians 4, 3, this is the will of God, your sanctification that you abstain from sexual morality. Number three, God wants unsaved people to become saved people. He wants saved people to become uh he wants saved people to become uh, holy people and he wants holy people to become humble people. 1 Peter 2, 13, be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution. This has been important for us uh, as church leaders guiding the church through COVID. And here's the thing, just because God is our supreme authority, that does not give Christians the biblical authority to dismiss the people that God has placed in authority over us. Now here's a tough one. God wants these saved, holy, humble people to suffer. Why? Because he wants us to ensure, he wants to ensure that we are not shallow people. We're not shallow followers. That we grow up and we're mature and we're strong, that we're battle ready because the battle is real. He wants us to suffer for his name. First Peter, read chapters, we'll read all of it. But specifically, 1 Peter chapters 2, 3, 4, the idea behind it is that we need to show the world that this is a treasure that is worth treasuring. That it's worth something, that it's worth the inconvenience, that it's worth the struggles, it's worth the care and the precision, it's worth the tears, that we would rather have Jesus than silver or gold or anything else. He's more precious to us than anything else, that we, we, we would be like that guy who walks in the field, finds a treasure. We'll sell everything that we have just so we might have the kingdom. Number five, he wants all people to be thankful people. First Thessalonians 5.18, in all things give thanks for this is God's will. Five principles. Five general principles that God absolutely wants for you this year. Guaranteed, it's in black and white in the Bible. It's right there. He wants this for you. And listen, see if we were only to do these five things this year, 
we'd be in a lot better shape going into 2022. George Muller founded the Bristol Orphanage in England, served 10,000 odd orphans. Story's an amazing one. You should look it up, read it. It's amazing. But he says, 90% of our problems were solved when we are ready to do the will of God, whatever it might be. If we as a church made a pact together in the coming year to do just these five things, it would be revolutionary. I promise you that. We would preach to the lost. We would become more set apart for Jesus Christ. We would become humble and submissive and honouring of the people around us in our community. We wouldn't complain because we would be thankful and appreciative in all things. As we go into the new year, we may not know what tomorrow holds, but we know who holds tomorrow. And we're certainly in stormy waters, but there are three lights here guiding us to the safety of the harbour. And if we can get them lined up on our hearts, we will be safe. Walk carefully. Watch faithfully. Work thoughtfully. Let me finish with an Irish blessing. Now, sometimes these Irish blessings can be a wee bit daft and a wee bit silly sometimes, but this one's nice. Let me read it to you. It says, during the new year, may you have enough happiness to keep you sweet, enough trials to keep you strong, enough sorrow to keep you human, enough hope to keep you happy, enough failure to keep you humble, enough success to keep you eager, enough friends to give you comfort, enough wealth to meet your needs, enough enthusiasm to make you look forward to tomorrow, and enough determination to make each day better than the day before. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we know that now is the accepted time. Now is the right time. And so, Lord, as we walk to you, as we walk closer to you, Lord, would we look to you to help us see and to seize these opportunities. Lord, that we would be salt, that we would be light, that we would bring warmth and healing and comfort to the world around us as we live out a, a God-glorifying life. Lord, help us to use our time wisely, whether we are in lockdown or in work or, or wherever we are, whoever we are with. Lord, help us to understand what is of supreme value in our lives. Lord, may we be watchful of how we walk. And Lord, we would ask that you'd walk with us in 2021. And we ask this in your name. Amen. Church, stay safe. Be kind. We love you. God bless.